for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Analyst with Tricom Funding. As a solutions provider in the staffing consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For the then, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to the staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Here today is Colleen Hobday. Colleen is a claims advocate at Assurance, over six years of insurance experience, with background primarily in workers' compensation. Experience lies within general industries, construction, and staffing. Colleen is responsible for assisting clients with all aspects of claims-related matters, and is on her knowledge of claims handling, best practices, and dedication to customer service for her clients. Assure is among the largest and most awarded independent insurance brokerages in the United States. A trusty broker and rated best place to work winner, insurance places coverage for all forms of business and no insurance benefits and retirement services through such offices located just outside Chicago, Illinois and St. Louis, Missouri. More hundred passionate insurance professionals provide verbal results and personalized services to thousands of clients across the country. Industry Insider Webinar will walk you through several advanced workers' compensation claim management techniques in preparing for defense duty programs, LA, a series of surveillance, and fraud indicators. At the end of the session, you'll know how you can gain more control of your workers' compensation claims and insurance destiny. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. At the presentation, there will be time for questions and opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit. I will turn the floor over to Colleen. Thanks. And just one further introduction on our end. Um, my name is Kurt Murray. I'm a, a partner on the staffing team. Most of the time, my job is to structure, develop, and implement uh, insurance programs for our clients. But today, I'm going to be assisting Colleen um, really with the thing of questions. So as questions come up in the Q&A section, I'll be either deferring those till the end of the presentation, if that makes sense, or asking Colleen during the middle of a particular section. So with that, Colleen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to start with a basic overview of workers' compensation. Um, No-fault system of benefits for injuries and illness um, related to employment. It covers all employees from the first day on the job. So first, first minute on the jobs are covered. Um, state administers its own unique laws and employer is um, responsible for the cost of insurance. Basic uh, terminology used, TT, which stands for Temporarily Totally Disabled. This is referenced um, with benefits, so the adjuster, if the um, injured worker is completely off work or um, on restrictions that the employer is not able to accommodate, they issue um, TTD benefits. They're obviously temporarily but totally disabled. Um, RT stands for either return to work or release to return to work. Uh, however, they may not be released to all previous duties. MMI, which stands for maximum medical improvement. Uh, this is when they release the person from treatment. So they still have some problems or pain, but um, at that point, the doctor's saying that there's nothing else they can do for them. Some, some use the term end of healing. It differs um, between you know, different states. TP, which stands for um, permanent partial disability. This is with regards to settlement. Um, so it's saying that the person is you know, permanently but partially disabled. So let's say someone has surgery on the shoulder, the release from treatment, they still have some you know, deficiencies or you know, ongoing with it, so they're permanently but only partially disabled. A and modified duty. Um, this one often comes up if FMLA can run concurrent with workers' compensation. It can. 
However, you have to make sure that your HR department um, sends out a notice letter advising the injured employee that the FMLA will be running concurrent with their work comp claim. Um, it is something that you have to be consistent with. So you either have to do it for all employees, once they're out on work comp, they're on FMLA, or for no employees. Um, you have to understand that um, once the ML FMLA is exhausted and the employee um, is terminated, you may lose some control of the claim, especially since you know they're obviously not working with you. There's no modified duty options, et cetera. So modified duty. Modified duty is a means to return the employee back to work during their healing time um, from the work-related injury. So actually, if they're on some restrictions, you know, desk work only, or they can only lift a certain amount of weight, um, and then back to work doing something. It's transitional in nature, and the job duty should be changed with the doctor's restrictions. So you want to make sure that you're getting a note after each follow-up from the employee that demands from the doctor what their restrictions are. General rule regarding modified duty, it's a, um, if the additional position extends past six months, it may be perceived to become a permanent position for them, and you may have some AA issues. Um, however, the thing I would recommend you talk to your employment counsel about. Modified duty options. If the employer is unable to bring the employee back to work with restrictions, there are some other options. There are vendors out there that will find work for the employee within their current restrictions. Um, employer does pay the employee during the time off. Um, a lot of the vendors will find work for them at, you know, a not-for-profit agency, um, doing tier work, charity work, just something they can do um, to get them in a routine, get them out of the house, you know, make them get up, get dressed, talk to people, and just have them so they feel like they're doing something, they're involved in something. Um, and studies have shown that employees will return to work 50% sooner than if they are just allowed to remain at home during the healing period. I can't stress that enough because people just sitting at home, not having anything to do, it just the game goes on and on and on. It seems just um, keeping them on a schedule, making them you know interact with people is very good for them and obviously the claim. Helen, a yep. question did just come in, so sure. if you could. Hold on. Mm -hmm. uh, question was, we're having trouble finding clients who, can prov who provide modified duty work for injured employees. Do you have how we, we, can, we can build and develop light duty positions for our company? Um, I mean, you know, you really, anything that you need done, you can work into a modified duty job. So you can ask around people, you know, if, if anybody needs help with certain things, if they're falling behind on something, they need help with filing, whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be even for... 40 hours a week. It can be for many hours a week, you know, a few hours a day, just something to get the person out of the house and into the work environment and just keep them so that they feel connected with people. Really anything, you know, putting someone else at work, just anything really helps. What would happen with, with the reimbursement for the employee's lost time if, say, that you were able to find light duty work for 20 hours and typically work 40 hours? How would that, who, who would, for that differential? A carrier would pay that differential. If it's a set amount, let's say they're okay, they're only working two hours, they can just issue the checks weekly. If it you know, might vary, then um, you or the injured worker can submit their uh, pay stub for that week to the employer or to the carrier, sorry, <laughs> and then they issue um, this. It's usually two thirds of the difference that issue to, to them. So, if for example, the agency had a higher compensated employee making say twenty dollars an hour, mm -hmm. but they're putting them in a meal task in the office that normally would warrant a minimum wage, seven or eight dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. Can that be accommodated? Yes, yeah, it'd be well? accommodated as well. And then who pays that wage differential? Again, that would be the carrier <clears throat> paying okay. the wage differential. So really just anything you can, you know, just to get in the office, it, it makes a huge difference if, over the life of the claim. It really just does. Okay. Surveillance and independent medical exams. Some pros and cons of surveillance. So when to request it. Um, you need to realize that surveillance is costly and should not be overused. Or if the carrier, you know, objects to it or doesn't want to go through with it and you really think that it's something that would be helpful, you can always contact your claims advocate and discuss, you know, rationale for that, and then they can go back to the adjuster to discuss further. 
Uh, if you have reason to believe that the employee may be working on their own home or doing side jobs for someone else is something that happens a lot. Um, you might have their own landscaping business or um, you know, do something on the side. They're a carpenter. Um, if you know that kind of stuff, it's really important to let the adjuster know that information because that helps when you go to do surveillance. If the medical records state that the employee continues to use aids to assist in movement, but sometimes you have them come into their actual location to pick up their check, and if you notice that um, you know, using crutches or the cane, or they seem to be doing just fine. That's also, you know, a bit of a red flag there. We need to remember that one day of good surveillance may not be sufficient. Um, it's frustrating, but often um, the claimant's attorney can just, you know, say was just having a good day that day, and it's not reflective of how they're doing on a normal basis. That's so why it's really important if you know outside things they might be doing, if they're involved in, you know, they play softball or they coach their child's team, anything that you know, let the adjuster know that because getting good surveillance is going to be really important. What you can expect from surveillance. If it obtains substantially showing the employee active when the employee is restricted from all or most activities, this can be either the treating doctor or the IME. So the independent medical exam doctor for an opinion. So they can send in their surveillance video. You know, a doctor say, you know, <clears throat> we have him on video doing, you know, A, B, whatever. Um, them comment on, you know, can they be released at this time or can they return to work, depending on, you know, the case. Video can also be used um, at the time of settlement to reduce exposure on a claim. Um, you know, if it's time of settlement, they can discuss it with the claimant's attorney. You know, we have them on video doing, you know, such and such, and kind of use it as a tool to get the settlement down. Or it can assist in making the, um, the claim to trial for a possible win or a reduction in value. Dependent medical exams. What's the difference between an IME and a records review? It's an evaluation of the injured employee by a doctor for an opinion. It's usually a one-time thing. Um, then injured worker to the doctor with all the prior records, they evaluate them, give their opinion. Um, a review is when a doctor um, reviews only the medical records itself. They don't see the employee in person, um, so they don't get any of the subjective complaints from you know, the injured worker. Um, this being said, obviously the records review would hold more weight than an IME, but a records review is sometimes, you know, can be very helpful. Um, in different ways than the IME. I, much like surveillance, are costly um, and should be used on a case-by-case -case basis. That's something, you know, if you, if you do feel it's needed, you can discuss that with the adjuster. Um, so some, for example, if somebody's, you know, their doctor is keeping them completely off work, maybe they'll send them for IME to say, you know, is he capable of doing type of modified work? Or if they feel that the doesn't correlate with the mechanism of injury. Um, those are big things, so if you feel that it may be one that that's, might be helpful on a particular claim, discuss that with the adjuster. And the yeah. ultimate authority to to use as an IME? Is it rest with the client or with the insurance company or the adjuster? Uh, the adjuster. I mean, if you really have valid reasons, they shouldn't be having an IME, or they should at least be able to lay out why they don't think that it's going to help, but it's up to them ultimately. But they have to hear from, you know, the employers, you're the first person, you know, you're the person that knows this employee. You're the one that sees them all the time. So if you have any information, bear with them. It's always important to do that. Um, I would be of any value, should specialize in the part of the body in question. That kind of goes without, you know, it's pretty explanatory. But, um, you know, if you have a back injury, you'd want to send them to a spine specialist. Can you can you find or identify the difference between surveillance and what's called activity checks? Um, surveillance is obviously the full blown. You know, you'd have them out there. Usually, you start with like days. Um, activity check is just to um, they kind of stop in, see or stop over right by their house, see you know any um, physical activities they're doing. If you know, kind of an employment check, see if they're doing anything. Um, really, a cost saving tool that you kind of 
do before deciding to do full-blown surveillance. Uh, so that's that's sometimes a good idea too. If the adjuster is kind of, you know, they want to maybe go full-blown surveillance, maybe an activity check and just kind of see if there's anything that maybe, um, you know, full surveillance would come in handy for. And also a way to 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 research find prior medical records related to a, uh, an L alleged back injury, for example? Yeah, there are. Um, usually adjusters will try to get assigned medical authorization from the injured worker initially. And um, when they go through and take their um, recorded statement, they'll get information, like if they have a primary care, they had prior injuries, obviously they don't always tell the truth, but usually they'll tell you, you know, their primary care doctor and stuff, and then they can um, send a request to that doctor, or if defense is on the file, he can subpoena records, you know, if you know the ARR, you know, they can subpoena from different facilities and get prior records. That's what they actually do pretty often, adjusters, I would say. Okay, so um, preparing for defense. Remember, 90% of all claims are legitimate. It's the other 10% that drive us completely crazy. Um, the employee has, uh, if the employee has retained counsel and their issues um, are in dispute, it's generally at this time that defense is um, brought into the claim. Understanding what you can and cannot do may assist in the movement of the claim to conclusion as prevent additional issues um, for the claimant's attorney to bring up. What you can do. Provision to the adjuster to include payroll information prior to any hearings. That's important if the adjuster is asking for stuff, especially if there is a hearing scheduled, get it to them as soon as you can. Um, Hitments from any coworkers or supervisor forwarded to the adjuster um, should ideally be done at the initial onset of the claim, but um, if not for whatever reason, you know, you just get the events and get them over to the adjuster prior to the hearing. And also just confirm with the adjuster or defense counsel if you know, yourself or any witnesses need to be trial to testify to anything. What you cannot do, uh, you cannot discuss the merits of the claim with the employee. Um, you can, however, discuss the issues relative to return to work and their um, follow-up appointments. So, you know, they should be bringing in doctor's notes to you, either confirming that, you know, they're off work, you know, they can have the doctor's office fax, anything, you know, but you should be able to get information from them. Um, the state of Illinois in particular, with regards to depositions, um, you cannot take depositions of the injured worker. However, um, they are allowed of the doctor, folk expert, et cetera. That does vary a lot by state, so that's something to talk to your adjuster about or defense counsel about. And red flag indicators. Um, you might think, you know, the accident never happened at all. Um, sometimes workers, get, you know, they're anticipating layoff, so they think if I have a work comp claim, I can't be laid off. Um, they might, you know, go ahead and stage an accident. If they have a pattern of claims, that's important. Um, you know, once they have a few claims, they get to know the system and know how to work it. Um, if they need time off, you know, be someone in the family is sick or they have children, um, children actually is it can be a red flag. Often I've seen where they might have three or four kids, and obviously, we you know, daycare is very expensive. So if, um, you know, for home, they're off work, they're getting paid to be off, and they're not paying for daycare. Um, obviously, if they're a disgruntled employee, that's, you know, that could be a, a red flag there. Um, some other red flag indicators, if the incident is not witnessed, um, People talk, employees talk, you know, they hear about things that their co-workers are doing. Um, so it's important to listen to that. Um, if the occurs in an area where the employee has no business being in in the first place, um, you know, if they're injured on the dock and there's absolutely no reason for them to be out there, that's, you know, a red flag. If the details are vague or contradictory, um, something just doesn't feel right to you, obviously if they're a problematic employee, um, often I would hear, you know, they've been up a couple times, and now they, you know, of course, are right before they think they're going to get terminated, they're going to file a claim. Or even as they're being terminated, I've heard that a lot, um, they will, you know, so I hurt my knee two months ago, so they report it as they're being terminated. 
um, if they refuse, uh, refuse to follow company procedures or fill out an accident report, that's a red flag. Um, indicators of no injury, if it's an unwitnessed accident, or if it's witnessed by, you know, friends that are um, coworkers. Um, AWIS, so the details are frequently changing. If they're overly specific, if it sounds um, rehearsed, I find that often if somebody, you know, especially with, with like a trip and fall or something like that, they they can give you details, but not necessarily step by step. They might be able to say that they slipped on the water and they fell, but maybe they're not 100% certain of how they actually fell, but they know that their shoulder hurts now. So they're overly specific and it's it sounds like you know they have too many details, and if it sounds rehearsed, that's definitely a red flag. Um, of claims, if they you know, again pending possible termination, uh, if there's layoffs, strikes, the holidays coming up, workers' compensation fraud indicators, um, the end did not occur at the workplace, so accidents that occur on Friday afternoon and the employee doesn't report to until Monday morning are a red flag. Um, even just early Monday morning, you know, um, report first place, was it something they were doing over the weekend? They decided that they were going to come in on Monday and, you know, say that they got hurt at work. Um, the employer knows employees active in recreational activities, so you may rely on tips from other coworkers or just your own observations, your own discussions with the employee. Um, work fraud indicators continued. Um, malingering. Injured on the job, so there, there's no question of that they were injured on the job, but they can need to complain of pain longer than usual um, for this particular injury. All their complaints are just subjective, so there's no objective findings to it. They just keep saying, you know, it hurts, it hurts. Um, if they refuse or prolong diagnostic testing, so they're kind of trying to keep the claim going without really finding out what's going on, um, it'd be a good time to utilize either surveillance or possibly an IME. The type of workers' compensation fraud, um, working or collecting benefits. Indicators of this might include, you know, they're never home when you call, or someone answering the phone saying that, you know, in the shower, they just stepped outside, they'll have to call you back. Um, a medical provider maybe observes dirty clothes or fingernails um, during doctor's appointments. I do find doctors, not all, but a lot of them will put a lot of um, in the notes, it's not just strictly, you know, findings on exam. They'll put observations in there, so that can be very useful. Um, they're missing scheduled doctor's appointments. Of course, everybody has, you know, they get sick or has family emergencies, but they should be going to their doctor's appointments. If they're not, that's definitely a red flag. So how do you as an employer reduce the risk of fraud? Um, verify their identification and background, offering notified work programs, which again, I can't stress how important that is. If you can get them back to some kind of work, um, just keep them, you know, involved. Let them know. So ask them how they're doing. I can't many times as an adjuster, I would hear from people that, you know, they're off work and it just nobody's been in touch with them. And it, it just helps for them to think that somebody cares. They're reaching out to them, just they're doing. And that's why if you have the, um, if you qualified work, you can get them back in and talk to them on a regular basis and just kind of keep them so they feel part of, you know, the company. In a photo ID of the employee at the time of hire, um, this can become useful if surveillance is needed in the future. If the referral is made to the surveillance vendor, they'll in touch with the adjuster and they will ask for, you know, the address, what kind of car they drive, a physical description. So if you have, I'm sure they can just send that right over. It makes it a lot easier. And also know your employees, know their interests, their hobbies, their employee background, you know, their friends within the company. And that's it. Okay, so we so certainly open it up for questions that you that you might have. And a couple of others have come in uh the presentation, so I'll, I'll walk Colleen through those now. So the question was with regards to fighting fraud, how effective are witness statements in helping to battle a potentially fraudulent workers' comp claim? say witness statements can be extremely helpful, but they have to be good witness statements. can't just be, oh, I was working with John and he fell. You know, we need times, dates, and specifics. What were you doing? Did he say anything to you? You know, ouch, I, you know, we were lifting something. Okay, what were you lifting? 
and, you know, did he say anything? Oh, that hurt my back. Is there any kind of information like that? So getting a good witness statement can actually be very helpful, but it just has to be more specific than I often see comes from employers. And then I've heard that one of the excuses to fight fraud is to get multiple sense from the actual claimant to look for inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that tactic? I mean, I that the best thing you can do is get a really thorough statement initially, which I know isn't always possible depending on, you know, the situation, but getting, a, a, you know, make them write down everything, not just, again, you know, I was working and I fell. Getting a thorough description with dates, times, what exactly they were, they were doing, what body part did they injure, I think that that's more helpful, but if you really feel that their story keeps changing, you know, maybe getting another statement from them, I just feel like for the injured employee, that's probably the kind of a flag if you keep asking over and over. But um, if it keeps changing, it may be something that could potentially benefit. Okay. Additional question. Um, have you seen success in re this, let's go back to the surveillance, I, I would assume, based upon the way the question is asked. Have you seen success in reducing the amount of a judgment or denying a claim as a result of surveillance or activities checks? I have. Um, it's it's not often, but I have seen it happen, especially when you get good surveillance. I had a claim I was working on when I was an adjuster where we had surveillance. I did have a legitimate injury, and he had a back surgery, but his and him were trying to say that he was probably and totally disabled, so he could never come back to any type of work. So we had surveillance done on him, and the um, vendor was actually able to, they followed him to a courthouse and overheard him talking about how he had been arrested. So defense um, looked into it and it turned that he had been in a fight and then got arrested for um, um, risk arrest. So we were able to get all that information because, you know, it's public knowledge. We were able to get that and then the surveillance and that information it helped to prove that, you know, he's saying he's permanently totally disabled, yet he's getting in bar fights and resisting arrest from police officers. So uh, I have seen it happen. It's not all that often, but it definitely helps if you know, you know, they're working another job or outside activities that they're doing that they can really catch them doing something. Okay. Uh, question, once an injury is reported, what can you as an employer do to ensure the best possible outcome for that particular claim? Okay. I think that's that's a good answer important from the outset of a claim. As soon as they're saying that you know, hurt themselves or something's hurting or they were injured, it's important to get, like I said, a full statement from them, any witnesses, their supervisor, and make them be as specific as possible. You know, what body part did they hurt? What were they doing? And I think just, you know, getting that information over to the adjuster timely is important. Just like I said, kind of be in touch with the employee, even if they're off work, checking in with them, that makes a huge difference for people. And you just kind of are also staying on top of, you know, them and letting them know that someone's watching, but just to make them feel like they're still, you know, someone cares and they're a part of the organization, I think is something that is huge that employers can do. Okay. Um, another question from a participant is, can you talk a little bit of how, what's some of the best tactics to use to fight bogus or fraudulent claims? Hmm. Best tactics. Well, again, I mean, I think that goes back to making get everything initially in the beginning of the claim, getting all the information, getting over to the adjuster, and keeping in touch with the employee and the adjuster. And, um, you know, if you have information that would help with surveillance, that kind of stuff I think is very important. Keeping in touch with the adjuster and letting them know. I mean, again, the employer is the person that would see this person on a daily basis, so they know, you know, what's normal for for them, they know their personality better, and just keeping the adjuster in the loop and giving that extra information, I think, is you know, very substantial for the claim. Okay. Would you also then be an advocate for fronting front claims of taking multiple witness statements and potentially, um, sorry, witness statements, potential potential multiple statements too from the uh, link to that uh, mm -hmm. immediate need that happens. At immediately after the, the, the claim occurs, right. and if that's refused or delayed, then you, that's a fraud indicator as well. Right, definitely. Let the you know 
gesture in the loop is important. So yeah, that's, that's a good point with the um, post-accident drug screen, letting the adjuster know if they refuse to do it or if they fail it, you know, keeping them in the loop on that. But that's also a good, um, which I think most employers have that in place. But Okay. Um, I think that does it for the incoming questions. So we'd like to thank all participants for their time today. Uh, we'll leave the floor open for another couple seconds to see if any additional questions do come in. Chris, we'll I do have... Amanda. I do have a question that came in. Um, when do you feel the staffing company should be represented by its own counsel? We've seen situations where we feel a claim is fraud and the insurance company wants to sell and we disagree with both parties. Good question. Um, I, I mean, I think if it's something that you really are, you you think it's that and you have legitimate concerns for it, it might be a good idea to bring, you know, in your counsel. But sometimes, unfortunately, the carrier will settle just because it's a lot cheaper than going to trial because trial costs are expensive. And I know that, you know, that sucks, especially when you really think that somebody, you know, it's a fraudulent claim. But often that's kind of the tactic that to take trial is just going to run up the, you know, the expense costs alone are going to run up. So sometimes that is why they just go ahead and sell for, you know, a feuded minimal amount. But I'd say if it's something that you have substantial reason, not just, you know, we know guys a fraud, if you have evidence to that and they're listening to you, then it might be a good time to bring in, you know, your own counsel to discuss it. In counsel is a really difficult uh, decision to make, and the insurance companies really despise when you involve your counsel. Now, if you're a large enough employer and you have, have the ability to dictate who your defense counsel is, we always recommend that you, it, during the negotiation with the insurance company that you do negotiate with your own chosen defense counsel versus what's called their panel counsel. In many cases, it's an attorney that you're familiar with, with based immunity, somebody that, that knows your business and knows your employee better than what the panel counsel would be from the insurance carrier. So we would say that during the negotiation phase with the insurance company, it's imperative that that is brought up at that point. Mm -hmm. $50,000 a year for your workers' comp coverage, odds are you're not going to be able to get your, your defense counsel choice. Um, if you pick up $100,000 a year, there's a better chance. And certainly once you're up and taking risk in your program, like on a large deductible or retroactive program, then you usually do have the ability to dictate who your defense counsel is, and you don't have to use the insurance company's defense. Uh, that's the best way, is just deal it up front so that you don't have their attorneys involved and you're using your own chosen counsel. That answers that question. We have a couple of additional questions that came in. So this one is, we have several workers' comp cases that seem to be going on forever because a medical center seems to be assisting the employees with getting additional visits and follow-up treatments, even though the original injury was very minor. It's a pattern with most of our open claims. What's your advice on this? Should we change or cancel our agreement with this medical, uh, with, the, with the clinic, or will this most likely continue no matter who we use as our medical center or send injured employees to? Lengthy, lengthy answer, most likely. An interesting question. I guess if you really feel that this clinic is because there are clinics out there that will run costs because they know it's work comp, so they'll get paid for it. So if you really feel like it is the clinic, then I would maybe think about terminating your, you know, contract with them. Otherwise, I definitely think it's something I'm sure you talk to the adjusters about. But get I me. That's where that really comes in handy. And cutting that, you know, cutting off the treatment. If you really feel, you know, it's just going on and on. It's not necessary. That should be something that the adjuster is doing. You know, very strongly that that you should interview all of your clinics that you're using. And if you have a large concentration of employees in a particular area and you can choose which immediate clinic that you can use for uh, workers' treatment, go with one that's treating your employees in the season treated and is more employee-centric than employee-centric. So if you're in a more populated area and you have choices, then absolutely cough that clinic. Go find somebody who can and interview them. You have every right to talk to that clinic and that management about how they, what their view is related to treating workers' comp injuries, because you will find those that are very employer-centric. 
versus those that are employee-centric, it can make a huge difference in the cost of the client. Uh, most of the insurance companies will have online a list of clinics that they have offers. We don't always agree with using one of those. And you may see some immediate costings because they've got negotiated PPO discounts, but it may not ultimately be the best case for you long term. Because you know, it's a chosen uh, clinic still may not be the best option. Um, also, I think important too, related to return to work, that the cl- the doctors at the clinic understand what your return to work and light duty capabilities are. That's so that if you get a physician in your office and they can see what your light duty opportunities are, they'll be more inclined to release people to light duty, knowing that you you can fill certain restrictions. Um, so another part of the negotiation. Of the discussions with the clinics themselves. And, Colleen? and I agree, and I think definitely getting one a doctor in that can look at your facility and letting them know if you do have modified work that you have it, because often um, injured workers will go in, you know, to their doctor or clinic and say that there isn't any, you know, modified duty. Sometimes they're lying. Sometimes they just don't know that there is. So that's important to communicate with whatever you know clinic or facility that you're using. Okay. Another question came in. Is there anything that can be done with a claimant when a claimant fails a drug test? We had a situation where the employee was terminated and a few days later filed a claim. It was never reported during his tenure. Fortunately, that, well, that varies addiction a lot. Um, so that would be something I would talk with the adjuster about or defense counsel. But um, often, just failing a drug screen does not mean that their claim may be denied. I, I I haven't really seen that very much, to be honest, um, especially depending on what the drug screen is positive for. Um, it, it test positive for, you know, marijuana on their system. You know, when did they use it? Were they under the influence at that time? There's just too much. Usually it has to be that, that they were, you know, so significantly, significantly impaired that um, there was other cause of the injury, but basically the substance. Um, which is unfortunate and frustrating, I realize that. But, again, it does vary by jurisdiction, the law, with regards to that. So that's something I would definitely talk to um, defense counsel and or your adjuster about. In my experience, it's extremely difficult to get a claim denied so based on the fact that an employee failed a drug test. Um, what we typically find is that the, the, the drugs or the alcohol use has to be the proximate cause of the accident. So the accident would not have occurred in the absence of the influence of the, the alcohol or drugs. And it's a really difficult standard to maintain and, and prove. So, you know, another thing that we can use to document and fight the claim with, but as a sole basis of denying the claim, we really it, 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 it's for that purpose. Very rarely. It's frustrating. I can understand that, but it's very hard defense to Okay, I think that does it for questions. Else, anything else has come in on your end, Amanda? Uh, we'll turn this, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'd like to thank um, our presenters today, Colleen and Kurt, for sharing their information and knowledge on workers' comp claims management. We will have a recording available on our website at www.tricom.com/resources. Should you have any questions or would like additional information, please feel free to contact um, either of us directly. The contact information is up on the screen. Thank you so much for your participation in the webinar today and for all your great questions. Watch for information on our next webinar session, which will be held December 12th, on preparing for year-end. Thank you very much.